Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this Microsoft Reactor live stream event. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're coming from. Um, we're very excited to have April Dunham, a partner technical architect at Microsoft with us. She will be presenting a developer's guide to the Power Platform Galaxy, which we're very excited about. Power Platform is all the rage right now. Um, this session will run for approximately 45 minutes with 15 minutes at the end dedicated for Q&A. Uh, but please do make sure that you ask questions as they come up throughout the presentation so you remember uh, they're relevant to the content. Um, and also just because with Teams live sessions, there is a 20 second delay from the speaker to the audience. So if you ask questions as they come up, they will be there ready and waiting for her to review. Otherwise, if you hold off until the very end to ask those questions, there might be a little bit of a gap or break um, between her re responding and, and you hearing it. So just keep that in mind. Feel free to post them throughout. Um, you can dro drop them into the Q&A chat. Um, as Please also note that this will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel. It usually takes a few days for it to get up there, so keep that in mind. I will share the YouTube channel link in the chat as well. Um, at the conclusion of this session, I will also be sharing uh, a link to our survey. The Reactor program is always striving to provide new and engaging content, um, and your feedback really helps us to curate topics uh, and find speakers that really kind of connect with the audience and what your um, interests are. So please just make sure that when I send around that survey that you fill it out. Um, at this time, I will go to April and let her take over from here. So welcome, April. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. All right. Um, so. I want to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me first before we get started. My name is April Dunham. I'm a partner technical architect here at Microsoft. Um, I'm an MVP alumni, so I was an MVP in the Power Apps and the Power Automate space before I joined Microsoft. Uh, I'm an active speaker and a blogger and a YouTuber, so I have links here to my blog and my YouTube channel. So if you're curious to learn more about the Power Platform and uh, SharePoint and Teams and all of that, I have lots of content out there uh, that you can catch. And also, you know, reach out to me um, on my blog as well. I have a contact form. If you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, so level set the agenda for today. Um, this is really going to be all about the art of the possible. So I want to talk about first, you know, why a developer should consider low code, give you a little one on one on what the power platform is and talk about, well, what's in it for developers? Why would you want to start using or integrating with the power platform? So going to be very high level. Like I said, I'll probably do a demo or two just to show you a little bit on the inside of the power platform and how to do a few things there. All right. So why low code? Well, one reason, so we have a problem today actually. Um, there's an app gap challenge. So we're estimating about 500 million new apps are gonna be built in the next five years, which is more than the apps built in the last 40 years. So that's quite a few apps that are needing to be built. Um, but unfortunately, there's five times faster demand for mobile apps than what IT can deliver. So we're kind of, kind of facing a shortage of developers. Uh, unable to meet the demand of all the apps that need to be created. So an answer to that would be utilizing low-code tools to kind of bridge this gap. Um, and what Microsoft offers in that space is something called the Power Platform. The Power Platform is Microsoft's low-code platform that spans across Office 365, Azure, Dynamics, and standalone applications. And it's comprised mainly of four different things. So it's all of these applications sit on top of what's called the common data service, which is our fully integrated uh, data model and database uh, for the Power Platform. And there's four main components, Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, and Power Virtual Agents. So I'll dive into each of these so we can get a, a level set understanding of them. And we'll start with Power BI. 
So this tool is going to allow you to get insights and data. So it's a dashboard and reporting tool. So you can collect data from various uh, databases. So this could be SharePoint, SQL, um, an Excel sheet, whatever it might be, and create rich reporting and dashboards, kind of like you see here. This is used quite a bit if you've watched any of the and seen any of the COVID uh, dashboards out there. A lot of those are actually using Power BI to host and surface up that information. Uh, the other is Power Automate. So if you need rich automation and workflows and business processes uh, for your business, Power Automate is a low code way to handle this. So you can have things like a trigger. So like what we're seeing here, when a new email arrives, you might want to automate that process and um, you know take a, the attachment from the email and figure out what contents in it and um, pull that out and write it out to a data source, whatever it might be. You can do that easily with this low code tool that Power Automate offers. And this is for legacy on them and cloud and for, um, platforms as well. Uh, Power Virtual Agents this is actually the newest one in the Power Platform. This actually enables you to create low code chatbots. So you'll have again kind of similar to what you saw with Power Automate, a drag and drop point and click interface where you can map out, you know, here's your question, here's your condition, here's possible responses. And you can have chatbots integrated in your website and teams, whatever it might be and have a really responsive low code virtual agent. And then the last one, which I'm going to be focusing on a lot today is Power Apps. So this is our rapid application low code tool to create responsive applications that work on iOS, Android, Windows and the web. Um, so something like what you're seeing here, you have one application, say for IKEA, that's working on the desktop or tablet and on the phone for scheduling, whatever it might be. You can easily create applications without having to write any code, but the power comes in when you add some code to it to really extend it, which is what we're going to focus on today. So first, OK, so now you know what we level set what the power platform is and the four main components of that. Well, why would you want to use low code tools for application development. Well, for one, it's going to help you meet business demand faster. So it's going to help you accelerate your front end development and business process development much faster than what you could if you're having to clean off from scratch with custom code. Um, so if you're meeting de demand faster, you're also going to reduce your cost. So we estimate you get about a 74 percent reduction in app development cost if you're at least using some element of low code application development in your overall solution. You're also going to have seamless app development. Um, it's going to help you because this is integrated within the Microsoft stack and 365. You're going to have that application security and lifecycle management built right in. Um, and it's the big one that I want to focus on today is the integration and extensibility. So while the Power Platform is this low code tool set, we make it very extensible. So if there's something that you can't do in the Power Platform right now, we offer all kinds of different tools and ways that you, as a developer, you can extend it, um, which is what we'll focus on. Now, um, just one other stat I want to throw at you here is um, they estimate that 33 uh, companies that empower citizen developers using low code tools are 33% more innovative. So what this is really going to allow you to do is you can now collaborate with those business users and create rich applications. And that's really powerful because business users, as we know, are the people that are really familiar with the process, right? They might be really hands on with it. So by enabling them to have a tool where they can maybe stand up how they think the screen should look for this particular application, um, it's really powerful. And then you could come in as a developer and then add in all the bells and whistles and functionality. And this really is a platform for all makers. So Obviously, it's going to be good for your citizen devs, right? It's the point and click drag and drop interface for them to quickly build a simple applications, but there's going to be a point to where an application requirement might get you know, a little bit complex or, or need some additional logic in it that a normal uh, business user just might not be able to handle. So it, you know, we have this extensibility all the way out to where professional developers can help add things like um, you know, custom connectors and things that we'll get into here in a minute. So one of the biggest reasons that as a developer you might be interested in Power Apps, for example, is to help you speed up your front end development. So with Power Apps, what we're seeing here, and I'll go into a demo here in a little while, 
you see that we have all the things that we would need in an application. We have, if we need a button, right? I mean, rather than having to go and hard code the button and you know develop that and all that, we can just click a button control, add it into the screen, and we have that. It has rich integrations for charts and images and uh, a picture control and barcode scanning and all of that. We don't have to custom code any of that. We just drag the widget onto the screen and we have that on our application. So it really it's going to accelerate that front end experience. Um, and that the deployment across multiple platforms is huge. So, you know, normally when we're building an application, if it needs to be supported on an iPhone or an Android device and the desktop, that's a lot of code that you have to, you know, create to make that be useful in all those different applications, right? Well, if you build it in Power Apps, it's automatically being able to be used in all of those different devices. So you don't have to worry about um, that from the development side of things. And again, so we estimated about 74% reduction in app development costs with this because we're able to use the drag and drop interface to easily build out our front ends and we can offload some of that application maintenance um, and extend ERP systems at a low cost. So that's kind of why we're saying that about a 74% reduction in app development cost. We also have built in security and application lifecycle management. So with the Power Platform, we're able to integrate within Azure DevOps so that we can automate common build and deployment tasks within our Power Platform based solutions. We can integrate with Azure Key Vault to keep our passwords protected. We can use Azure Active Directory for security roles and permissions on these applications. And we have a rich set of governance tools. So if you're deploying the Power Platform at scale and really using that in your organization, we have something called the Center of Excellence, which you can use and it's gonna help you provide guardrails and standards and maintenance and everything for the governance of your Power Platform solutions. So it's really a fully baked product here. Um, we can also extend apps with great flexibility. So there's easy um, integrations and add-ons for VS Code where we can build and develop things for the Power Platform. And of course, if you harness the power of Azure on top of all this, you can add even more power to your Power Platform applications. So some common scenarios of where we might use the Power Platform, obviously for a web and mobile front end of an application or maybe you're extending a line of business app. So rather than custom coding that, you would leverage some of the Power Platform tools. And then of course, for those custom business process scenarios, these are all three great use cases for utilizing the Power Platform. And when I say it's, you can add even more power to the Power Platform with Azure, kind of here's what I mean. So we have Power Apps and Power Automate, for example. So Power Apps being that low code uh, application development and Power Auto Automate being the workflow piece to that. Um, so that's for every developer. So that's the low code tools. But for pro devs, we can utilize Visual Studio and VS Code and use GitHub and Azure services. So if you need to connect to say, Azure API management, you can pull data from Azure API management into your Power Apps and your Power Automate applications. You can use analysis services, cognitive services, so you can create rich AI-based applications with maybe facial recognition, whatever it might be, speech to text, um, using cognitive services. You have IoT Edge and IoT Hub, and you can use Azure Web Apps and even call the Microsoft Graph and harness the power of that to pull data across all of the Office 365 services. And Azure SQL is a great data source for Power Apps that you could use and Synapse and even Cosmos DB. So all of these tools that you're probably already using as a developer, if you're you know, within the Microsoft stack, you're able to take that and use and consume within your Power Platform applications. Diving a bit more into the Azure AI set of things. So we can use that for say bots. So we can have like interact with a bot within an application with the Power Platform and machine learning. Um, so all of that functionality, uh, form recognizer, cognitive search, video indexer, all of that can be used and consumed within the Power Platform. Um, so when we think about, so we showed some common scenarios, right? About where you might use the Power Platform. Well, now let's talk about what a modern application could look like if you're harnessing your dev skills and also using the Power Platform. So you could have your low code app creation piece and then use pieces of, you know, manage compute platforms, manage databases and artificial intelligence to create a holistic modern application with the hybrid of the two tools. 
So this uh, one way that's a great way to get started with this is to use some of the out of the box solutions that we already offer for the Power Platform. And one of the newest solutions out there is the return to work solution. So, you know, right now, obviously, we're all trying to navigate the, the pandemic and COVID. And one of the big things is like, how do we return to work safely and how do we manage that? So we've released a set of solutions built on the Power Platform to help with that. So some things included in the solution are facility reopening and readiness and um, some employee return to work applications. So that's a great way to, you know, you can install those into your environment and see how you can extend those maybe with API management. You can go and call out some APIs to get, you know, from the CDC to get more information about that and integrate that in. Maybe you want some cognitive services. Maybe you want to integrate with the, the facial recognition. So when an employee logs in, rather than having to enter in information about who they are, you just recognize um, based off their facial recognition. So lots of ways that you could think of to extend something that's already out there to get your ideas going and get a, a holistic solution ready. So that, that's one way, and there's a link there um, to that in the slides. All right, so I've talked a lot here, and I, you know, again, wanted to just give you like an art of the possible of why would you want to use the Power Platform as a developer? Now I want to transition and go, you know, this is the developer's guide to the Power Platform Galaxy. So I want to transition and talk about what are the three main components from the Power Platform side of things that are useful for a developer where they can extend this. And the three main things I wanted to focus on today were connectors, components, and application lifecycle management. So I'm going to start with connectors. So this is, to me, the biggest and easiest way that you can extend your Power Platform applications with your pro dev skills. So the Power Platform runs on these things called connectors. That's how it talks to all these services. And what a connector is, it's just, just a wrapper around an API that allows the underlying service to talk to Power Automate and Power Apps. Right? And how this works is there's over, I think right now, 415 different connectors that the Power Platform has. And these are you know, not just Microsoft services, obviously Excel and OneDrive and SharePoint and all that, have connectors, but as you can see here, there's connectors to other SaaS services like MailChimp and um, Salesforce and DocuSign and all of that. So we have about 415 different connectors. So what that means is if you're a developer, you don't have to worry about you know, creating some authentication into Salesforce, right? And all of the logic and code that goes along with that because there's already a connector for that. One connector can have you know, an action that's going to let you add a record into Salesforce and read an, a record from Salesforce into your application. That's all built for you thanks to this connector model. So you build the connector, which is the wrapper around the API, and then your end users, the citizen devs, can consume that in their applications. And where this really becomes powerful is there's two different types of these connectors. So there's the public connectors that are available to all users. So if you go out to Power Apps or Power Automate and you look through that list of connectors, those are all public connectors. So, you know, your Office 365, your OneDrive, your MailChimp, all of that. But you can take that even further and create your own custom connectors that are built for your organization. So if there is an API that you have out there, whether it's an internal API or maybe just a, an external public API that there's not a connector for, you can create your own custom connector for that, use that in your environment, and have that working in your Power Apps and Power Automate applications. So that's what I want to focus on right now is like how do we build these custom connectors and what are some use cases? Now, I said a custom connector is a wrapper around an API. Now, what kind of APIs can you connect to though with these custom connectors? So these are going to work with any RESTful API. So this could be public APIs from things like Spotify and Yelp and NASA, whatever it might be. It could be public APIs that you manage. This could be Azure Functions. It could be Azure Web Apps, Azure API Management, um, and more. Or it could be private APIs via the on-prem data gateway. So if it is a private API, we offer something for the Power Platform called the on-prem data gateway. So this is a gateway that you set up between the Power Platform and your internal environment in the enables the two to talk so that you can connect and read and write data between that. So it extends it even further. So now this isn't just an application for automating and creating apps in the cloud. It can also connect to your on-prem data. So really powerful. So any RESTful web service, you can create a custom connector for. 
Let's take a look at the architecture of how this is working from the custom connector side of thing. So here we have our power platform. So we have power automate and power apps, right? And then on the right, we have our RESTful API and we want the two to talk. So what's going to happen is you're going to have your custom connector that you'll build. And that's going to be in the hosting environment, right? So this the hosting environment could be, you know, Azure API management, for example, and there's really native integration for there. Uh, so Power Automate and Power Apps are going to consume that custom connector. And it's going to do that using the connector model. So when a user consumes one of your connectors, they have to authenticate into the connector. So they're going to pass their credentials, and it depends on how you have the authentication set up. So it could be, you know, authenticating with Azure AD and just passing in their credentials that way. It could be a, an authentication token, whatever it might be. Uh, but they're going to connect to your connector with their unique cred credentials when they load the application or the workflow. So that's going to take those credentials. It's going to send that to your RESTful API. So you're just going to have your host, your path, and your credentials. That will RESTful API will confirm that that you have access. Um, pull, you know, take your request, post put, whatever it might be. Talk to that, take that back to the custom connector. Custom connector will then return that back to your flow or your application within Power Automator Power Apps. So, you know, pretty simple and straightforward how that's working, right? So we talked about, OK, we have to have that connection to the connector, right? We have to pass our authentication. So what are our options here as far as securing our API? So right now, custom connectors support these standard authentication methods. So it's going to support generic OAuth 2.0, OAuth 2.0 for services like Azure AD, GitHub, Salesforce, Dropbox, et cetera basic authentication and API key authentication. So any one of those um, you can use to secure your API. As far as, well, how do we describe the API so that the custom connector can read it and we can import it into the Power Platform? Well, you can use three different things. So one, you can use Open API 2.0, AKA a Swagger file. So you can use Swagger to kind of handle this for you. Or you can even use just a Postman collection. So you could take your API and save that in Postman as a collection, and then we're able to import that directly uh, into Power Platform as a custom connector. Also, you can start from scratch. So if you have your endpoints um, and all of that, you can actually just build your connector from scratch uh, within the Power Platform, which we'll look through here in a second. As far as building a custom connector, so okay, now we know you know the security accepted, the type of APIs we can connect to, and all of that. Well, how do we actually build the thing? Uh, first, you have to develop. Obviously, you got to build, secure, and describe your API. So, an import from existing artifacts, whether that's Open API, Postman, building from scratch. Uh, then you'll need to test it. So, Power Platform offers a built-in testing mechanism to test your API when you're building the custom connector and make sure it's working. And then, of course, you'll want to actually test that within your Power App or Power Automate application that you want to be using that in um, first uh, for end-to-end -end testing. And then finally, share. So the connectors have to be shared with anyone that you want to allow to consume it. So you have the connector itself, and you can share that with everyone in your org or just specific users. So maybe it's to some kind of, you know, proprietary database and you only want certain people to be able to access that, um, you can choose who can use a custom connector that you build uh, with the built-in sharing. So with that, I'm going to segue here into a demo. All right, so for the Power Platform, we're going to start in Power Apps. And to get to Power Apps, that is part of Office 365. So we'll come here to the portal and we'll select this Power Apps button. That's going to open up Power Apps here. Now, I just want to show you first, before I get into the custom connectors, just how easy it is to get started building a Power Apps application. Now, one of the easiest ways, in my opinion, is to start from one of the templates. So if we see here, we have an option for all templates. And we have these ready to use built in applications that you can get started. And there's some really helpful ones. So like, you know, something that you might need commonly is like a help desk application, right? or a site inspection, budget tracker, um, and expenses. This is a really good one too. Um, there's lots of need for some kind of expense reporting solution. So let's take a look at that one, for example. 
And each one of these are different. So this one you can tell um, is a Canvas app in phone. So when you build a Power App, you do kind of have to choose, are you optimizing this for the phone or the tablet? So it'll work on any device that you choose. But what that optimization option means is this one you can see is a little um, narrower. So it's optimized for the phone, right? Um, but this template, for example, for inventory management is optimized for the tablet because it's taking up more real estate. So while this would pull up on um, a desktop, you'll just see that it's a little bit more narrow. So that's the difference there. Uh, we can make truly responsive applications that, you know, this expense one, for example, that would start out narrow and we can make it respond um, accordingly to the device too. So that is an option um, to have responsive apps. But for this example, if we wanted an expense application, right, we could just use this template, click create, and that's going to create a copy of this template in our environment and power apps for us to use that's basically ready to use. So it's going to load and run, go through the loading process, and it's going to open this up in the edit mode of the power platform or the power apps so that we can see just how easy it is to drag elements and customize these power apps applications. It usually just takes a few minutes. So here's uh, one thing I wanted to show you and why I wanted to show you this template is this screen right here. This is a connector. So this particular template is utilizing SharePoint as a data source. So since it's utilizing SharePoint, it's went in and they've added the SharePoint connector. And now this is what the authentication aspect is going to look like. So when any user loads an application for the first time, it's just a one time only. So you have to authenticate into the connector the first time that you load the app is going to look and then it's going you have to allow or don't allow to connect to that and this is what passes in the credentials of the user that's using the application so now i've authenticated into that connector so it's going to continue loading this app and as we can see here pretty simple drag and drop interface so if i wanted to customize this at all i can click on insert and we have things that we'd expect like labels, buttons, text, and this could be uh, text inputs. It could be rich text, even a pin input, which is a signature. So if we wanted to get a sign off of an expense, for example, we can have a built-in signature component where we didn't even have to do any custom code. Um, and even HTML text. So we can really customize the UI of these things with this HTML text control. So any HTML we have, CSS, we can put that in here and really customize the look and feel. Uh, we also have things like galleries. So if we need to show a array of information, we can use a gallery and all we have to do for these galleries is bind that to a data source. So for example, on the data source dropdown, I have all these different data sources here. I can select that and it automatically binds it. And that's all I had to do from a configuration standpoint to surface up an array or of information here on my application. So you see it's pulling that all in there. So very simple interface and lots of stuff built in. Uh, media, if we expand that out, here's even more possibilities we have out of the box. So we can easily have images. There's a built-in camera control. So if you are using this for some kind of inspection application, for example, and you needed to take pictures of whatever you're inspecting, you can use the camera control for that. There's a barcode scanner. So I've created um, in my time, I built hundreds of apps here within Power Apps and I've created lots of inventory management applications. And the barcode scanner has really come in handy for that. So this actually um, just, utilizes the barcode scanning functionality that mobile devices and tablets already have. So it's just a button that you put on there for the control, but it's going to initiate that barcode scanner and it automatically does everything it needs to pass back and pull in the data from the barcode. So it's pretty cool and powerful little button there. Uh, so if we look at more, we also have built in video, uh, Microsoft stream and audio and microphone. So you can also use this to take notes um, with your. So if you have someone out there on the field, rather than having them you know, enter in all these notes and, and typing that in, you can maybe put in a microphone control and just have them automatically, um, you know, click on that and enter in their notes there. And this would be a great integration piece from a developer standpoint. So what if you could take that audio from the microphone and automatically do like a, a speech to text and put that into the uh, field for that? So um, another great use case there. 
And we also have PDF viewers and maps and even 3D. So this is relatively new for Power Apps, but there's a built-in mixed reality capability within the Power Apps application. So, I mean, that's a whole other thing from a development standpoint that is quite a beast to custom code, right? Is any kind of mixed reality integration. This is just a, a mixed reality object that you add into there and you just point it to whatever 3D object you're wanting to consume and then you're done. So really, really simple. Um, and you have some built-in icons and all of that. So there, there's the mixed reality piece and you would just point it to a 3D object and it would be able to use that within the application. But for this app too, you'll see how easy it is. So simple app, um, we have, we're able to add a new expense all through this template, right? We select the start and the end. So we have calendar controls and um, we have drop downs for like an approver and cost center and all of that. Click create creates the report. You can even add line items. So fully functional expense report application natively here with a template. So I just want to show you that so you can see how easy it is to get started. Now I'm just going to close out of this real quick and let's talk more about that connector piece. So if we look at the connectors, first we have connections to connectors. So that's what this connections tab is doing. So any time that I've went in and built an application, and I've added a connector to a service, I've connected to it, those connections are stored here. And this is personal to me and what I've used in my application. So each user that has went in and used an application, their connections to those connectors will show here. Now, what if we want to build what's one of those custom connectors that we were talking about? Well, that's here on the custom connectors tab. So if you click that, this is going to show all the custom connectors that you've built for your environment. And before I do that, let me show you just again, like where can you see all of the connectors that are already there? So one way to do that, so these are connectors. Power Automate and Power Apps share a lot of the same connectors, but Power Automate has a, some more connectors than what uh, Power Apps does. So if you look here on Power Automate, for example, you'll see a connectors tab. This is where you can see and browse all of those connectors that are available for you to use, say within Power Automate for a workflow process. So you can look through all of these, um, you can click on one. So you see like, for example, there's a connector for Azure Monitor. So if you wanted to connect to that, you can see information about the connector. And one of the things I love about these is there's rich documentation. So if you click on the see documentation button, it's gonna take you to a doc, so Microsoft.com site, where you can find everything you want to know about this particular connector. So what um, what's it going to work with? You know, because these um, taking a step back with Power Automate, for example, it's the low code workflow tool. It's actually built on Azure Logic Apps. So if you used Azure Logic Apps in the past, um, Power Automate is just Logic Apps, but targeted toward the low code user rather than the developer user. Um, so a lot of these connectors, you can use both in like Power Automate and Power Apps, but also Logic Apps. So this will tell you uh, what regions and you know what license you need and all that stuff uh, for the different services to use this. And it's going to go through throttling, throttling limits and what actions are available and uh, give you some descriptions on here, are the parameters for the actions. So everything you need to know about a particular connector is all documented here. So this is a great place to go and just explore what connectors are even out there for you to start using. Now to create the custom connector side of things, so if there's a connector to an internal service or maybe a public service that you don't have a connector to yet, it's super simple to get started. So you'll see that I'm actually have three different custom connectors here. So if you click this new custom connector option, here are those three different ways that I was saying that you could create a custom connector. So one, you could start from blank, so you can actually build out your custom connector straight here from the Power Ops portal. Um, or you can use an open API file, a Postman collection, or from an Azure service. So with the open API file, you can either import the file directly, point it to your open API URL, and then you can also import the Postman, and then of course from the Azure service. So what I have did is I actually had a Postman collection. So I have went into this option and I said import from Postman. So I would give my connector a name. Select import browse to the file location and to my Postman location um, and that would continue there. So what I have did, I've already started that. So I'm just going to go into this one here. And you'll see what the process to build a custom connector looks like. 
So first you're going to define uh, the icon and the name and all that because that's what shows up here to the end user when they're looking at the custom connector. So it is important to make sure you have a good detailed description and icon and all of that for that. But you can tell here you can define your scheme, whether this is HTTP or HTTPS. Um, if you're using the on-prem gateway, this is where you would choose that option here to connect via the on-prem gateway for um, an internal on-prem type API. And then you just walk through the process. So the next phase of this is configuring your security. So what are you going to use to authenticate into this? So in my case, I chose an API key. But you could choose any of the options that we talked about earlier, right? You can have OAuth 2.0, basic auth, or even no authentication. So you would choose a type of authentication, and based off what you choose, the options below are going to change. So for example, if I choose OAuth 2.0, it's going to prompt me to fill out my client ID and secret and token and refresh URL and all of that. So it's just really a, a nice point and click interface, and it's going to prompt you what you need to fill in. Um, for as far as security and all of that to go through the process. So then you'll go to your definition. This is where you actually define your actions. So um, for here, um, I'm just going to do one simple action for this particular custom connector, and I want to get information about a person because what this API is doing is it's going to allow me to insert someone's email address and it will pull all of their contact information. Um, so for that, I'm just going to uh, define the action and here's where you would put in your endpoint. So this is the endpoint I would call for that particular action. And once you put that in, you can import from a sample and that can automatically fill in all of your information. So the query that you're returning, your properties, your body, your response and all of that. So it really kind of builds out a lot of this for you, right? Um, and then finally, once you're ready for that, you just go into your testing. So you can actually test real time from here. Now, before you test, you'll have to go in and create a connection to your connector. So that's what I talked about where you have to pass in your authentication. So you see I've already did that here, but if I hadn't, I would have to go to new connection. And in this case, since I'm requiring an API key, I would have to put in the API key to authenticate into that. So you can test right from there. Uh, let me go back here real quick, make sure my connection's there. And I'll go back into the edit. We can see um, from the testing, I can put in an email address, run the test, and it's going to give me a response real time below. So it looks like I had a 200, which means it was successful, and all the information there is returned. So pretty simple to use. Now, how do we actually use this, though, in one of our applications? So if I click on my Apps tab, I'll have an application here, and I'm going to run this first, and then to show you how it works, and then I'll open it in edit mode. So we can see how I integrated that. But first, let's walk through a scenario. How is this working in our application? So I have an app here that's a customer, you know, kind of like a lightweight CRM application. So I want to be able to go in and add a contact. And rather than having to manually type in all this information about this new contact, like their location and their job title and what company they work for and all their social media information, yada, yada, wouldn't it be cool if I could just put in their email, click a button, and have it call my custom connector and fill in all of that information about the person with my API. Uh, well, that's exactly what we can do here. So I've just entered in that information and just calling that Clearview uh, API that with the custom connector we just created and filling in all this information about me. It's pretty powerful. And how that works is, so I have this open in edit mode now, and you see that it's asking me to authenticate here into the Clearbit API. So I'm going to allow. That's a custom connector we created. So to use this on my app, all I had to do was add in that connector. To add a connector, you can go to View and Data Sources. So that's where we can get all the connectors. And I can select Add a Data Source, and I'll just look for that custom connector I created. So here are the custom connectors. So I can select that. That will add that into my application, which it has right here, as you can see. Uh, and now I can start using it. So from the contact screen, if we go here, you'll see that I have a check mark. So this is where it's actually going to call my API with my custom connector. So let me expand this out. And you'll see that um, in Power Apps, there's no code per se, but how you make 
actions happen and functions is with these functions like you're seeing here, which is very Excel like. So it's um, kind of think of the code as like Excel formulas in a way of how you handle things. So, so a lot of this will seem familiar to you. So uh, for example, we have things called global variables and we can define a global variable in our Power Apps using a function called set. So we can set a global variable called person info. And then this is where we're actually going to call our custom connector. So we'll put in the custom connector's name. And then just like how we're used to in you know, VS Code or whatever development tools we're using, uh, we have IntelliSense. So I can do a dot after that. And it's going to show me um, below like what's it expecting. So for the variable, for example, it's going to expect me to give it a variable name and a value. Um, and then for this, I can see it's going to pre-populate below with the dot what information is available to me. So I can see there's a dot people. And then with that, it's going to pop up and I can see it's expecting an email. So it kind of lets you build it for you and is telling you exactly everything that it expects there. So that's I just use that kind of built out my string. So I'm calling the people method, passing in an email and then doing a dot and I'm getting the person object. And then for the company, I'm getting the company. So that's how I call it. And then I'm just consuming that information here in my individual uh, labels that I have, so my controls. So for the site, for example, I'm going to call that variable that we created called person info, and I want to get a property off of that called site. And we just map that accordingly to that global variable. So it's really as simple as that. Uh, to get started using these custom connectors and again a really powerful way to extend the power platform all right so i'm going to switch back to the next to the slides and the next big thing i want to talk about from a ways that you can extend the platform and that's with components so there's something called the power apps component framework so this is one unified framework across all types of Power Apps applications that allows you to provide a standardized experience instead of common controls. So I briefly showed you on Power Apps all the controls we have available, like we had a video control and an image and a barcode scanner and all of that. So there's lots of controls natively, but there might be use cases where you know you need a really custom kind of controls, like maybe you need an Arc GIS map component or control in your application. Well, this is where we offer with the component framework a way for developers to build a component like that that then our end users can consume in your Power Apps applications. So it's really, really powerful. So it's uh, kind of how it works is it's just a, it's an interface um, like socket. So you have your API SDK for controls that provides control lifecycle methods and data and metadata and design and all that. And the control implements that interface and UI rendering logic. So really straightforward. Um, so what makes up a component itself is a manifest file where you obviously have your control definitions. You have your control implementation, which will be either TypeScript or JavaScript. Um, so you have your user interface and functionality there. And then you have your resource files, which are just your artifacts. So if you're using any JavaScript libraries and CSS and images and all of that. So a pretty straightforward implementation, but you can do powerful things with that. Say, for example, uh, fill in some gaps. So let me close out of this real quick. So one of the things with Power Apps is <clears throat> that we don't have at the current moment is printing. So we don't have an out of the box way to print in Power Apps. But that's something that we could do with one of these custom components. So for the components, how they work is you go in and you can import those as a solution. So we have the solutions tab here and you'll see that there's an import button. So you can package up these custom components that you build and add them in a solution, which is what I did here with this button print. So once I've imported that as a solution, now I can start consuming that in my applications. So if I go back to my apps tab, we'll see that we have this test button application. So I'm going to open up this test app and we'll take a look at how we can use a custom component in an app. So it's really simple. It's just going to look um, slightly different than how we add the regular controls that we were looking at earlier. Okay, let's open that.
and I am saving time at the end, just FYI for, for questions. So if there's any in the chat, I will get to those here in a second. I'm wrapping up here. So to use that custom connector, we can come into here and we see an option here in the plus for code components. So any custom component that you create with code, you can go in and add here. So I can click on that and that adds my print button components directly onto the canvas. And now all I have to do is tell it what I want to print. So for this particular one, um, I'm using, uh, I'm converting JSON basically to a table for this print one. So I can put in stuff like, you know, ID, and I'll just hard code that and title, whatever it might be. Um, and that will go and open up and then it will, you know, open up a print window. So pretty simple, you know, scenario of things that you can do with a custom component. So again, to augment and fill in some gaps there. All right. Um, and then finally, just uh, the last piece I said was ALM. So um, obviously a big part of this is you might be, you know, tag teaming with some of your citizen devs on development and you might want to automate the life cycle of this. So with the Power Platform, we have things called environments. So just like we would with custom code, we can move our applications from a dev, a test to a prod environment. That's something that we can automate here with um, the Azure DevOps integration. Um, and GitHub integration. So we can use build pipelines um, and all of that and to automate our builds. So it's just options and you know that are available there for you for that. Um, oh, I did want to show just like one or two case studies of like, well, how are businesses actually using this? So one good example is Priceline. Um, they kind of went all in on the power platform from their development team when they realized like how fast that they can build screens and use those components. Um, to save time, it can build a component once and use it in multiple applications. So um, they were gathering information about data sources for error reporting. So kind of the architecture that they came up with is it created a power app that reads data from custom web APIs that are surfaced through functions. So they're using a power app here that's calling Azure Functions and using a Power Automate and storing data in Azure Table Storage. Um, and they're getting data from third party systems up into Power Automate. Um, and it's all this great holistic solution. So just an example of how you can, you know, think of architecting solutions with some custom dev in the power platform. So, you know, table storage is one option. Um, you think, look at Blackmore's, you know, they're getting data, you know, um, from CSV files and they're integrating with Power BI and Azure API management and data factory and um, their ERP system. So just lots of great use cases there. Uh, in American Airlines too, their contact me solution is pretty intense. If you look at the architecture for that, um, they're using rich reporting with the Power BI and uh, Azure Data Lake and Event Hubs, and they're using Teams as well. So this there's great integration with the Power Platform and Teams. Um, so you can, again, they're using some graph API calls and they're using custom APIs and their solutions and App Insights um, and pushing all that and using Power Apps and Teams for their user experience. All right, and there's you know, some more use cases, but I want to leave time for questions. So a um, few resources here that I wanted to leave you with. Uh, so to get started, um, I go to aka.ms start power apps. So that's going to give you some great information about you know, how do you get started. There's the great Microsoft Learn documentation out there. Um, Azure, like I said, is a great way to extend the Power Platform. So you know, if you want to get started with Azure, you can do a free trial there. Um, some of those customer stories that I kind of glanced over, um, those are all available at aka.ms WAC customer power apps. Um, so you can see some of those examples there. And if you want to learn more about power apps itself, we have this great set of training called App in a Day. So you can go and just devote one day of your time to learn power apps from, you know, nuts to bolts. Um, so that's, that's another good resource there. All right, so with that, I'm going to look at questions. Look like we have quite a few here, um, so which is great. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to start by, let's see, where do we go? Okay, is Power Apps available in Office 365 Personal? Uh, good question. So Power Apps, I know that's, it ha you have to have like a business premium or um, like one of your E3 SKUs. So it's in the, in the kind of businessy uh, versions of Office 365, but there is a Power Apps community plan. 
So if you want to kind of play around with Power Apps and you don't have like a business premium or E3 SKU of Office 365, you can get the Power Apps community plan and start testing out all the Power Apps applications there. And there's also an Office 365 developer plan. So I do have a video on my YouTube called How to Get Started with Power Apps. And in that I show how do you go and get an Office 365 developer plan and that Power Apps community plan so you can get started you know, uh, with your feet wet um, in that. So that, that's a good way to get started there and good question. Um, let's see. Can I share my app with users that are not in my tenant? That's another great question. So with Power Apps, um, it's really intended to be used within your tenants, right? Uh, it's not a kind of like a, you wouldn't build an app that you would go put on the iPhone app store, right, in Power Apps. But uh, with that said, we do have some options here. With, with Power Apps itself, we can connect via um, Azure AD B2B. So if you have like another organization that you wanted to have an application that you know you can both use, is we have something called Power Apps Portals. So this is separate from the standard Power Apps, but if you need to create an application in the Power Platform that is truly public facing, right? And that could handle anonymous access, you can build a Power Apps Portal that could handle that. Um, so that would be something if that's interested to you to look into is Power Apps Portals and that side of thing. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Uh, when creating the app and it has a send email functionality by Power Automate, as a response to certain events, will the from field of the email be the email of the current user using the app or it has to be a specific value? So that's a good question that kind of gets into the weeds of how Power Automate functions. Um, so from with Power Automate, when you create a flow using Power Automate, um, it's going to take the credentials and authentication of the user that created the flow and use that for certain actions. So with email, for example, that from field is going to show that it's from whoever created the um, flow and not actually from who may have um, kicked it off, like if you were passing it from like a Power App. Um, there's certain things where like uh, with approvals, for example, you can choose the requester um, and it can kind of mask that. Um, but for most actions, it's running under the authentication of the person that created the flow. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, OK, another question. Do you have to create separate custom connectors to be used by Power Automate and Power Apps or can you reuse them? That's a great question as well. No, you can reuse those. You don't have to create separate ones. So these custom connectors, you create it once and that connector can be used in both Power Apps and Power Automate. So you don't have to create them twice. Um, another one here. Does Power Apps support automated testing? Um, or is this a manual testing process? Yes, uh, there is built in testing tools, um, which I, I should have showed. Uh, actually, I think we have a few minutes here, so let me show that real quick. Um, so here, for example, so we have this Power App open. If we wanted to run a test on that, you'll see this option here on the left for advanced tools. So now that we have a few things at our disposal here. One is monitor. So if we want to you know, kind of debug some performance issues, um, we can use the Power Apps Monitor and it will run uh, the application and we can identify bugs that way. Uh, for unit testing though, there's an option for test. So if we open that, we can actually run a unit test with this tool. So it's, it's really new, it's still kind of in a experimental as you see, but it's pretty cool. So you can have your suite and your case and you can define those so you can have a different action here. So for example, I can record my screen, right? And I can run through a test that I want to go through. So for example, if I want to run through, okay, does the people picker work? So I can go in and select someone from the people picker. I can go select a task and I can test, uh, does this patch work? So it's going to run through that and record my steps. So now I can click done. And now it's just built in an automated test for me real time so I can save and publish this test and run through it and make sure everything works. So that is built in and powerful. And this is a, you know, an area where they're really investing in more is how can we make this, you know, offer more of that developer experience type tools into our Power Apps applications. So that's what, you know, monitor and this testing functionality is doing. Um, Oh, share the video. Um, yeah, so that, that is out there on my uh, YouTube. And um, so if you just go to YouTube, 
wacapp.com. Uh, wax C, Wax April Dunham. That's where you can find. It should be like a kind of the promoted video on there where you can see, uh, you know, that's getting started with Power Apps video and how to do that. So, um, great. I think I've answered all the questions that I noticed in the chat. I believe. Hey, April. I'm just jumping on. We did you see the question from? PG, do you have to create se separate custom connectors to be used for Power Automate? Did you just? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I answered that one. So you, okay, you, you don't have to uh, create custom for both. You create it once and it's used in both Power Automate and Power Apps. Well, I'm just scrolling through as well. I'm not seeing anything else coming through either. That was a lot of great questions all. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, while we wait and give people another minute or two to think of questions to ask, if I'm going to just pop on here for a second um, and remind everyone I dropped in the chat the survey link. So again, you know, we try to bring content to the community that is of interest to you and current, you know, everything new that's coming out. Technology is always developing, so we want to hear from you in regards to what you're hoping to see, you know, what you want to learn about. We primarily focus on a lot of beginner content, but we also offer, you know, intermediate and more advanced if it seems like that's what the community is hoping to see. So do fill out that survey, give us your feedback. Um, we really appreciate it and you joining us. Um, let's see here. We just got a new question. I just put it into the published for okay. you, April. Great. Uh, let's see. So can we create a service account in Office 365 and make the flow run with the credentials of that service account? Uh, receiving an email from a person who didn't send anything just because the flow is running does not sound good. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can do that. Um, you can, you know, create kind of generic accounts so that the emails uh, seem like it's, it's coming from that. You'll just have to be careful of, you know, like any multiplexing issues or uh, like running into API request uh, limitations. So like depending on how um, you know, much you're using that uh, and how many runs you're having a day in that particular uh, workflow, you might run into some issues there. Um, so, you know, just something to be on the lookout for. But yes, it, that is possible. I just dropped another question. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, how would you test for different groups of users in Power Apps? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question too. Um, I mean, you know, the testing right now, the you know that I showed you over here is kind of uh, that, that's the extent of it right now. I don't know if they're going to be you know giving any additional you know use cases for this um, where you can kind of extend it for testing for multiple groups. Um, you know, but for that, I mean, I would just say like kind of the, the old school way of of running through. I mean, you could have you can share um, this play link. So, for example, if you copy that um, and publish that, you can give that to multiple people so that they can run through the test, you know, using their credentials and see if it works. So that is one way that you could do that. Awesome, thank you. So we're at time. Um, I'm just going to this point tell everyone thank you again for joining us thanks for participating along and all of those awesome questions thank you april so much for taking time out of your day to pop on here and you know go through all of this and really get thorough into it and go that extra mile and on answering all of those questions we really appreciate it as well and have a great one everybody this will conclude the event thanks for having me thanks everyone